Hello and welcome to the first RLDR seminar series of the 22-23 academic year. I am so delighted to have Fatima Jalena here as our Professor of Geophysical Hazard Risks. It's her inaugural lecture. <laughs> a huge achievement and we're really proud that Fatima is with us. She's joined us just from September, so a really valuable member to our team. She did a PhD in Stanford, she's worked at the University of Naples and then joined us here at the IDR. Um, I'm not going to talk about what she is going to talk about because she's going to do that for us, but we're going to have her title, How Active Community Engagement Can Contribute to Multi-Risk Scenario Definition, and we look forward to that talk, and there will be time at the end for a few questions. Thank you very much, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. I hope you can hear me. You yeah. can, yeah. so it is working. Okay, um, thank you everyone for... Um, for being here, and uh, and obviously this is um, this is a very special occasion for me because this is the first uh, formal presentation that I'm giving as a staff member of IRDR, and uh, clearly uh, because of that it, it 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 marks like an important point also for um, for my career. So because of all of these reasons, I thought it would be very <laughs> fitting to make it a presentation about ideas, about thoughts of uh, how to uh, conduct my research in the, in the following years. So um, it is going to be a bit, uh, let's say, disruptive respect to my usual presentations. Uh, usually my presentations are full of equations and everything, but this one is going to be different. Uh, as I said, it is about uh, ideas, and uh, since these ideas are um, quite dear to me, quite uh, important to me, it was also very important for me uh, to have your feedback uh, your thoughts on it from uh, the very beginning. Um, so um, let's start uh, with this. Um, I'm an engineer, a civil engineer by background, a structural engineer, and as you know, structural engineers design solutions. So uh, with this first sentence, clearly I'm going to uh, put that on the question. So it is saying, 
that um, it is better to um, put people in a condition, in a situation, in a capacity that uh, they can find the solutions. They have the power uh, to respond, to self-organize. Uh, so this somehow uh, sets the tone for, uh, for uh, my talk today. And uh, as you saw, it is about the stories and how uh, useful they can be um, for multi-risk assessment. I mean, um, it is useless to start to tell you the story of Noah's Ark. I mean, you're all familiar with it. Um, maybe a less known fact, I, I even didn't know uh, about it before I started to gather material for this presentation, is that actually um, this uh, story, this myth, is maybe inspired from a real flooding event. Obviously, that flooding event didn't flood the entire, uh, let's say, Earth. There is not enough water to do so. But it was a very big flooding event in Black Sea, it seems, uh, 5,000 5, years BC. So it kind of shows that the stories that we all know, that we have grown with, are usually based on something real. So there is a great connection between reality and the stories and how they, they change and they are shaped in our uh, memory. Uh, clearly today, uh, I would like to talk about how stories can help us kind of imagine how the future is going to be. So, so, so sort of a, like a reverse situation with respect uh, to uh, this one. Um, so, um, so since um, this is going to be very much about uh, community engagement, about public engagement, uh, I thought it would be good to see what are the different ways uh, scientific information can be uh, communicated to, uh, to, um, to the communities, to the stakeholders. So let's see actually uh, who, who are the stakeholders usually as far as it regards to communi communicating scientific output. So these are some uh, obvious ones. Uh, so the first one are the scientific experts, which is us, which is you. Uh, um, and then there is the communities, who are the people who are going to be affected directly by the result of these uh, scientific fun, fun, uh, findings. Uh, clearly, there is the civil society. Uh, we have the authorities. We have the policymakers. Uh, and then there is the private sector. So you see, it's like a sort of a movie, let's say. There are a lot of actors involved, and it's a question of how this scientific information can be communicated. So these are some models, and um, forgive me if they are not really based on expert knowledge, I mean, because clearly I do not have that type of background, but it was like information that I kind of found uh, also in training courses that, that uh, train researchers for writing proposals. So um, this is a uh, deficit model for scientific communication. It is the so-called one-way model, which is the most unfortunately common one, is that you produce I mean, the experts produce the scientific information and then they communicate it to the interested communities, to the stakeholders. So the, the characteristics are obviously the fact that it's sort of one way, uh, there is no direct feedback. And um, one important feature is, um, is actually the barrier that you see here. So that kind of shows that there is no uh, engagement. Um, Clearly, things can be improved into like a sort of a dialogue model, which is obviously based on a two-way communication. Uh, so there can be a lot of public consultation, a lot of um, polls that are actually based on public feedback. But still, you can see the barrier here. So that shows that it is not an active title, type of engagement. So there is some barrier still between who is producing the scientific knowledge and and so still some uh, sort of a deficit here of knowledge is imagined. So uh, clearly, uh, there is a way in which you could actually remove the barrier and arrive to a sort of a model that is based on conversation. So obviously, you can imagine that this is based on active involvement of the public. And um, obviously, all of the words that 
all of us somehow uh, have been saying, have been doing, like co-design, co-creation, they are all in this sphere, citizen science, so they, in, they imply active involvement from the stakeholders, from the communities. So what are some examples, I mean, of public engagement? Uh, so here are some uh, examples. So you can see from top to the bottom, uh, we go in the direction of increasing involvement from the public. So in the first levels, you see the communications like public hearings, public meetings, in which you communicate some scientific outcome to the public. Clearly, in these cases, the feedback exists, but it is very limited. And it also implies that the feedback is going to somehow arrive after the end of the process. So no interaction during the process. And as you go down, you arrive to more public involvement, for example, the public participation when you do co-governance, when you do uh, community-based participatory uh, research, citizen science, these are more uh, based on active engagement uh, from the public. There are also more active uh, instances, for example, public activism, in which the public tries to kind of show their voice to who makes the analysis, so some sort of demonstration, some sort of activity that comes from the public. But in this talk, we kind of, we stop at this level, and we would like to see how we can actually use stories as a context, as an excuse for uh, having participation from, uh, the, from the stakeholders, from the public. Uh, but before um, talking about the stories, it would be uh, good to um, kind of think about, so how, um, how we, by we, I mean the risk engineers, the civil engineers, the people who kind of are some way involved with numerical modeling uh, of risks and, uh, and hazards have, have done so far in terms of communication with the public, in terms of engagement uh, of the public. Um, clearly, it doesn't look that good. Uh, I mean, um, usually um, it is very much one way, very sequential. In fact, the kind of arrow that I show to you uh, somehow uh, presents a, uh, a probabilistic framework that is used very often in the sphere of seismic risk assessment. And as you see, it starts from the modeling of the phenomena and then it moves towards hazard modeling vulnerability, risk, and then the results go in that arrow to who makes the decision. So you can see that it is one way, and clearly it implies that at the end of the process, the decision maker, the policy maker, the stakeholder is going to be uh, involved uh, in this uh, process. Um, examples, um, so this is um, a recent work we have done. I mean, uh, so um, I can blame it on myself. Uh, this sort of, let's say, one-way uh, type of communication. So uh, it's an example uh, in probabilistic tsunami uh, risk analysis. So um, it actually represents a collective work, uh, which is from a cost action uh, on a tsunami risk. And uh, you see, it starts from hazard assessment, and, and then it moves towards uh, vulnerability assessment. So this part deals with the consequences uh, on, on the physical environment, mostly in this type of uh, framework. And, and then it moves towards quantification of risk. So risk can be quantified in terms of loss of life, uh, economic loss and a loss of functionality and stuff like that. So you can actually see the flow and you see that it is uh, obviously not based on a lot of uh, public engagement. Um, so uh, before actually talking about public engagement, it would be important to ask one uh, question and that is, whether this type of one-way, uh, let's say, uh, sequential framework for risk assessment works for multi-risk analysis. Because clearly, this model has so far worked quite well for the scientists because it has been easy, it has been uh, sequential and practical. But does it work for modeling situ for situations in which you have multi-risk? 
So let's see what do we mean by multi-risk. And um, before doing so, I'd um, like to put a quote by um, a scholar who is kind of acknowledging the fact that uh, up to some years before, most of the efforts in the realm of uh, natural hazards were kind of limited to separate hazards. So we have a lot of researchers who excel in their own field of hazard, like seismic hazard, tsunami hazard, we talk about, um, let's say, um, like wind. But, but there is not much talk about the fact that there are a lot of interactions that we need to catch. So he actually very, I think, nicely kind of talked about a whole tapestry of hazards and risk that it still needs to be woven together. And so as far as some definitions, um, I have to say that uh, there are many definitions available about multi-risk and, uh, and I'm sure that um, many colleagues here have, have, have a lot of different and alternative definitions. But let's look at it as just some example of how complicated things can get. So just let's go beyond the, let's say, the terminology, because it's not even the terminology that I personally use, but it kind of shows how complicated the real world problems can get. And, and, and the tools that we have been using so far might not work. So this is a um, single hazard analysis. So it is simple. It shows that only uh, one type of hazard has been considered. You can obviously take it to the level of risk and then it becomes a single hazard risk framework. You could make it a little bit more sophisticated by considering different type of hazards, like wind, uh, earthquake, but without considering interactions. So this becomes a sort of a multiple hazard analysis. So it's still not a multi-hazard because you're not modeling the interactions. <laughs> the dependencies. And if you take it to the risk level, it becomes some sort of a multiple hazard risk analysis. So we can take it another level further and try to take into account the dependencies that exist at the level of hazard. So let me make an example. For example, uh, if you do uh, aftershock hazard analysis, clearly you need to take into account the triggering effect that each earthquake is going to have on the earthquakes that are going to happen. So in this case, you are taking into account some sort of interaction at the level of hazard. And if you take it to the level of risk, then obviously you're going to do a multi-hazard risk analysis. It is still not exactly a multi-risk, but it's a multi-hazard risk. Then clearly you can still make it a little bit more sophisticated by taking into account not only the, the interdependencies, the interactions at the level of hazards, but you can also take them into account at the level of consequences. And you can imagine how many interdependencies can exist at the level of, um, of consequences. Um, so, so this becomes a sort of a multi-risk analysis. It turns out that um, as we go on and as our societies become more modern, more connected, more interdependent, even the term multi-risk is not perhaps able to, to kind of uh, convey the complexity of the situations with which we are dealing in real life situations. Because, for example, the stakeholders, the people who make decisions, they are going to tackle real life problems. And real life problems are not going to be constrained just by one hazard, as we find very convenient. So the reality is going to be complex to the extent that even multi-risk analysis might not still convey how um, complex things are in reality. Uh, but before talking about that, I also show what I mean by interactions. Clearly, there are also um, different definitions available for how hazards can interact. But it is just important to know that they can be classified in such terms, for example. You can have uh, a triggering relationship. So um, they're also called cascading hazards. So in which one event causes another event to happen. 
So you can see this is a complete sequential um, type of event. You can have uh, a less stronger type of dependence. You can have that one event happening can increase or decrease the probability of another one happening. So in this case, it's not that one event is going to lead to the other event, but they are going to uh, interact and affect each other. So clearly, um, this is another type of relationship that you can have. And then you can have coincidence in the sense that two events happen at the same time, but without necessarily affecting each other. So in this case, they are also called independent events. So, so these are the type of interactions I meant uh, in a multi-risk uh, framework. But as I said, um, we still need to uh, use other terms, stronger terms, to describe the type of challenges that our modern societies are faced today and obviously tomorrow. So um, we have, I don't know if you have heard about the term systemic risk. That kind of starts to show uh, the level of complexities. So I'm going to show some excerpts from literature to so, show, show uh, how they are uh, interpreted. So systemic risk refer to um, the probability or risk of breakdowns in an entire system. And this type of breakdown can happen because of whether the system is very complex, a lot of interdependencies, as you all see in our everyday lives, um, a lot of uh, uncertainties that we also sometimes call the deep uncertainties, the type of uncertainties that you might not even know they, um, to how to uh, describe them, and obviously very complicated and nonlinear cause and effect relationships. So all of these can call this kind of very uh, large scale breakouts uh, in a system. Clearly, as I said, the risks are becoming increasingly systemic because of the fact that our societies are becoming increasingly complex and interdependent. And obviously, these kind of risks, since they have a large scale, they cannot be separated from the context in which they are. So they are also very much dependent on the economic context, on the social context in which um, they happen. So, um, and um, clearly, um, which is the main point about systemic risk, is that for governing them, for managing them, you cannot rely on one person. You really need to have a large group of stakeholders. You need to have the point of view of everyone in order to try to describe the type of complexities that, that exist in uh, real day uh, problems and challenges. Another um, characteristic of systemic risk is that they have a large scale, so they are not going to be bound by, by geographical or administrative boundaries. They can go beyond boundaries. They are trans, trans boundaries. So look, they are something like this. So you have a large level of being trans boundary. You have a large level of complexity a lot of nonlinearity, and usually there is also some tipping point involved, some point, some the last drop beyond which everything is somehow going to get out of hand. And I think the examples I put are examples that we all know, like uh, the desertification, uh, unrests, um, volcanic activity, large tsunami. So, so you can imagine systemic risk or uh, kind of examples that, uh, that we uh, know. So um, I'm just going to go back again to the linear model of risk analysis and kind of uh, remind ourselves that it can be used also for multi-risk analysis. It is actually used also for multi-risk analysis. But mainly, the vulnerability definition in it becomes some sort of a, not a exactly multidimensional, let's say, uh, concept. It is a lot centered a lot around the physical dimension of vulnerability. Um, clearly, um, vulnerability is a multi-dimensional concept. You can see actually it involves different aspects. So the physical aspect is here, it's very important. 
but you have also the social aspect to it, the institutional aspect, the economical aspect. So even geometrically, if we would like to show that type of vulnerability, instead of showing it by a line, we can show it by a circle. So it's like a more of a circular concept, more inclusive of different dimensions. So um, being an engineer, I mean, I like to see it also geometrically. So uh, started from the line, which kind of shows a sequential uh, risk analysis, a sequential model for communication also of risk. With this type of uh, circular model that is good for describing a context. And I just put them together. Um, so, um, so I arrived to a shape like this. I mean, clearly it doesn't say anything to any one of you. But it turns out that there are scientists and important ones who, saw, who thought that it actually looks like a snake. And so, so you see that this comes from the nature. And it kind of shows the increasing complexity of the analysis, shows some iteration, and is very much nonlinear. So we managed to just uh, evolve the simple line into this. But clearly, what is the relation of this to like a modern system of governance of risk and systemic ones, by the way? So this is a framework, actually, of uh, risk governance. Um, I think it's one of the many actually frameworks that have been um, proposed. Uh, it's in the literature. I liked it because of its uh, flexibility, let's say, to be applied to different concept, contexts. But it's not the only one. But you can see the snail, and I'm going to show you the different phases of it, and then um, we can see how it relates to uh, our talk today. So you see that the first step does not start from the um, office of any scientist. It's a pre-assessment of the situation, of the frame that you have in hand. So it kind of implies that you start it with the stakeholder to see, to evaluate the frame. And then you have an appraisal, appraisal of risks. And the appraisal of risks, actually, if you see it here, has two sides to it. One of them is risk assessment as People like me, engineers, know it, like more numerical, more based on simulations. And the other one is the appraisal of the perceptions of the risk in the society. And that is actually quite important for making any sort of impact uh, on the society. And then we move uh, towards characterization of risks. And that means to decide and evaluate that what level of risk is acceptable for a public that is really dependent on how the public feels about something. So you need to also establish that based on obviously engagement. And then there is management, which is uh, the solutions, the appropriate solutions and implementing them. In all of this, you have the communication which is somehow at the center of this snake. So it, it is not at the end of the process, it is actually at the center of the process, implying also graphically that all of these steps of risk assessment needs to be centered around the, the communication. So that uh, is um, how we arrive to uh, the type of the second part of the talk, which is focused on scenario building based on public engagement. And uh, before starting it, because I'm going to show an example, uh, I would like to say that uh, my talk um, is not about why uh, it is important to have public engagement or it's good to have public engagement. It is about how essential it is to have public engagement if you want to do any type of um, credible uh, systemic and multi-risk uh, analysis. So um, let's actually see some definitions, a scenario. Um, uh, there are many definitions for scenarios actually in the literature. Um, I chose one that came uh, out of uh, a initiative that I coordinated last year for a proposal, a European proposal. 
Um, the proposal that I would like to acknowledge, because there were uh, a lot of researchers involved in it and uh, was not successful, but it left us with a different understanding of how these things are working. So I thought it's important to um, acknowledge all of those colleagues uh, from whom I learned so much. And uh, kind of this definition of scenario, um, as you can see, came up out of that work and shows that it is here defined as a replica that implies somehow a digital replica of a virtual multi-hazard <laughs> event and its consequences, and kind of says that scenarios aim to improve our understanding uh, of um, events and their multifaceted events by uh, numerical simulation. So as you see, um, it implies that everything starts from the room of a scientist. So you gather scientists, some assumptions, and you imagine how the trend is going to be future. I mean, you know, I mean, everyone know what uh, a scenario is, how you build scenarios. So then uh, after this um, definition of uh, scenarios, we can actually move towards stories. Stories um, can help us as catalysts of dialogue. And here I can show like a story uh, telling uh, situation that you can see is quite different in contrast with the, with the room of a scientist. It is a much more relaxed setting, involves more people, people that are going to tell stories, simply tell stories. And um, so let's see stories. So clearly, um, in this context, we thought of stories as description of scenarios, but descriptions in simple terms, not in scientific terms. Like in plain language, you first describe what is the type of scenario that you would like to model. And you're not going to try to get technical about it. You're trying to get detailed about it, try to describe what is it that uh, you would like uh, to model. And Clearly, you can immediately see the advantage coming from it, and that is it immediately creates a common language between people who are coming from totally different disciplines, like scientists, the people that I show at the beginning, the stakeholders at the beginning of the talk. Everyone is coming from a different background, but everyone can connect to a story, to some plain language description of something that is going to uh, happen. And um, in that sense, they can be described, the stories, as a starting point for scenario building. Once you define the story in plain language, then you can actually go and dissect it into different implementation parts and numerically implement it. So um, I thought that I would show an example here. Um, so clearly, um, before doing that, I'm going to talk about two different steps about stories. One of them is actually crafting the story, which is obviously going to do in a participatory way, otherwise it's not going to, to make the same effect. And uh, clearly you're going to define the type of context, a lot of information, like any normal story is going to have. And the good thing about it is that you can even include some risk management aspects in it. You're not supposed to just say, OK, what if something happens? You can also say, uh, what if I do something about it? How that scenario is going to change? And, um, and obviously, um, you can put different type of activities that are aimed at increasing the awareness of the population and kind of see how they are going to change how your story is going to go. So an example of that um, is, uh, I thought it is fitting, I'm coming from south of Italy, so the story I'm going to kind of show is uh, based on a, a catastrophic earthquake uh, in, uh, in Sicily in uh, 1693. It is known as the Great uh, Sicilian Earthquake. Um, it is, the story is very loosely based on that event, so it's by no means faithful 
it is totally the, the point was to be totally free in kind of taking that real event and interpret it as we wanted. But as the Noah's Ark situation, also this one is based on something that actually uh, took place. So I have actually divided it in different acts, like a play, so that we can see. So the first act is a volcanic eruption. It turns out that in the real situation, uh, the, the great earthquake of Sicily, which happened in 1693, was preceded by a great volcanic eruption that was some 20 years before the earthquake. So I think it was in 1648 or something. I mean, that kind of ballpark of number. And so the drawing that you see is actually showing the lava that started from Etna and arrived to the sea. But in our story, we kind of made it a little less important uh, eruption because we kind of wanted to model a scenario that was not that catastrophic. We imagined that for causing disruption, you could do with much less than the great uh, Sicilian earthquake. So we kind of, what you see here is a description of a volcanic activity that talks about a column of ash of 2,000 meters high, which is which is actually quite common for Etna. If you live in Italy and follow the news, you can see it happening. And um, so clearly no one died in this type of story that we said here, but obviously it was enough to close the airport. And you know that closing the airport is going to create a lot of disruption in terms of connectivity. So what happened next? So a few days later, uh, a, an earthquake happened. It is This part is quite faithful to what actually happened in Sicily. Uh, the great event was preceded by an earthquake uh, that was uh, lower in magnitude, like two days before. So here we kind of um, made also this foreshock a little bit uh, weaker than the, what was the historic one. The historic one, I think, was a 6.2. We made it a 5.8 foreshock and you can imagine a foreshock of 5.8 on some uh, older existing buildings can be quite devastating so we imagined unfortunately our story here can imagine some casualties took place but the great consequence of this event we imagined was the fact that people were too afraid to actually sleep in their own houses so it created a situation in which a lot of people for many days stayed in their cars. And these are situations that actually uh, have happened uh, in, uh, in Italy. The photo is um, the photo of the port of Messina uh, in uh, 1908, right before the tsunami happened. So I couldn't find the, the photo equivalent for Catania, but kind of shows like that sort of um, calm before something really huge uh, is going to happen. So here uh, we have the, the earthquake itself. Uh, it happened after a couple of days after the foreshock. So you imagine the fact that people were staying in their cars, were not in their homes, was a very positive fact because a lot of lives were saved in this case. But you imagine this is just some assumption. A lot of lives uh, were saved. We uh, weakened the earthquake with respect to the historic one. The historic one was 7.54, and if I'm not mistaken, is the strongest earthquake that has ever been recorded in Italy. We made it 7.1, and you probably know that from 7.4 to 7.1, a lot of things change. So it is actually quite a different type of earthquake we are talking about, much less catastrophic. Uh, than uh, what you see here. Uh, Catania was involved by the earthquake in this story, collapse of buildings, and, um, and clearly uh, a lot of people uh, died, but in any case, still, uh, it was, could be not very devastating. So some um, moments after the earthquake, some minutes, uh, a, a tsunami alarm is issued because the, the magnitude is going to be 
um, decided by uh, INGB in this case, for example. And if it is larger than a certain level, the alarm is going to. So there are some characteristics that this kind of story uh, kind of had. So the alarm was issued and uh, after seven minutes, and so evacuation was uh, announced. But then um, the problem is that there were some problems. For example, there were some soil that was um, prone to liquefaction close to, uh, where the, um, close to where the airport is. And that caused a lot of problem of connectivity. And there was a fire by the port because uh, there were a lot of um, um, things stored close to the port, so that was a fire. So that see, created a, a sort of a context where the sea started to recede. So you know that the, when the sea starts to recede after an earthquake, that's an important natural sign of a tsunami that is going to happen. And in fact, uh, after uh, one, two minutes after the alarm, uh, the tsunami hit Catania. So this is actually based on actually what happened in the uh, in reality in 1693. And uh, so we kind of, since the earthquake was a little bit weaker, we kind of weakened also the height of the tsunami wave because if I'm not mistaken, the historical accounts say that the heights of the the height of the waves arrived up to five meters. Clearly, you can imagine, I'm talking about a time of about seven minutes and kind of didn't left, leave much time for people to react. Even the alarm was issued, but they didn't know where to go. Even if they wanted or knew where to go, mm -hmm. a lot of roads were closed because the buildings were damaged and they closed the roads. Uh, some infrastructure like the bridges uh, were collapsed, so they kind of lost that type of um, connectivity. So created a situation uh, that was not at all um, uh, good. Also, a lot of people who were sleeping in, their in the tents, in their cars, in areas close to the sea, unfortunately, could be good for the earthquake, but was not at all positive for uh, evacuation uh, for the tsunami. Um, things get even worse, and also unfortunately in real life, because some minutes later, other parts of Eastern Sicily got affected by the tsunami, and waves of even higher um, height arrived to the Eastern part in the South of Catania. So we are talking about the zone of Augusta, uh, which now is host to uh, a lot of industrial plants. In fact, there is an any plant over there. And we imagine that the height of the wave over there is going to be even higher. So imagine a height of six meters, which is again less than uh, what comes from the historical accounts. Okay, so this is um, the... Um, this is the example of a story. So it is a story and very loose, and we took every liberty with it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, the community participation because that was the objective of our proposal was to get the community participation. But we did have participation from different stakeholders, and that was good because they could give us some input about how to make the story more uh, relatable, how to make it more realistic. And so then you might ask, OK, so you define the story in, um, in simple words. So now what you're going to do with it? And I would say it is simple. You play the story. And how, what I mean by playing the story, I mean that you're going to actually uh, involve some numerical and also qualitative analysis of the narrative that, that you have formed. And so how that is going to be done, um, clearly um, the criteria for how you would like to implement a story into a scenario are very much depending on the context and on the stakeholders need. You could do a totally numerical implementation. You could even do a qualitative implementation. So it, it depends on what are the needs on the other side, but clearly the objective is to make a sort of an implementation. So that's what I mean by playing the stories. And um, clearly, 
In our case, we had couples of stories, one of them like a sort of a baseline uh, story that would lead to a baseline scenario. Then we had a sort of a um, counterfactual story that would lead to a counterfactual scenario. So for example, what if people would stay in their houses? What if uh, the bridges were stronger and the roads didn't lose their connectivity? So these kind of counterfactual situations I'm uh, refer referring to. And um, another thing is that as you can imagine, stories can be very complex and we can never claim to really do justice to them by a numerical uh, implementation. But it, it doesn't matter. It would never diminish the value of a story. Um, you could do what you can. I mean, and since I'm an engineer, you might know that engineers are used to mock up solutions, finding solutions that are kind of approximate kind of work. So it means that the level of uh, accuracy in the implementation is never going to um, kind of um, question the power of a story to kind of raise uh, awareness and increase the collective knowledge of some imminent hazard or uh, something based on what uh, the, the community decides. So, um, so based on that, I just thought of showing uh, some implementation steps to you. Um, clearly, they are just kind of showing how you can dissect the story that I just showed to you in different steps. I mean, it's just for illustration. So everything started from a volcanic eruption. Uh, it is not proven. I mean, there are controversial uh, views on it that uh, a volcanic activity might actually affect uh, the stress distribution in the crust. So it might actually have some sort of an effect on uh, the occurrence of the earthquake, but that is not really something under debate. So I'm going to show it by some sort of dashed, uh, let's say, uh, connectors to show that it is debated, but some sort of dependence. You know that the occurrence um, of the foreshock is definitely going to increase the probability that a main shock is going to happen. It is the type of triggering that I was talking to you uh, uh, before. Um, obviously, volcanic eruption, some sort of dependence, like a weak one, we don't know, but we can hypothesize. Um, the main shock can lead to submarine landslides. In fact, the historic event that happened, it seems so far the most credible because still there is no agreement on the causes of the tsunami. But it seems that uh, a submarine landslide that was triggered by the earthquake kind of caused the tsunami. So that seems so far the most plausible uh, explanation. Uh, the main shock clearly was followed, as you know, by many aftershocks. Actually, they were quite uh, long-lasting uh, in time. The submarine landslide caused the tsunami. The main shock obviously caused damage to the buildings. It also caused damage to infrastructure. So, for example, bridges. I mean, infrastructure important for connectivity, uh, important for evacuation. Uh, also, aftershocks contributed to the damage to the buildings, uh, as you know. They also contributed to the damage to the infrastructure. So that is a type of dependencies I was talking about uh, before uh, in the consequences. Uh, the tsunami also, when it hits, causes damage to the building and causes damage to infrastructure. Clearly, the tsunami, uh, in this case, triggered a tsunami alarm. Um, damage to buildings clearly is going to affect the connectivity of the roofs because a lot of debris is going to fall. Uh, obviously, the damage to infrastructure is going to do that. I mean, if you lose the bridges, you're going to, that is going to severely affect uh, the connectivity of your roofs. Damage to infrastructure uh, can lead to a leak. Um, in the industrial facility. Connectivity of the routes is going to definitely affect to a great deal the evacuation. 
damage to the building also is going to affect the evacuation. Um, damage to infrastructure, well, that I have shown. Another important factor is the level of awareness of the population of, of the fact that something is going to happen, whether it be it an earthquake or be it a tsunami. That level of awareness is going to directly affect the preparedness of the population and their readiness to act. In this case, you might also agree that the fact that the main shock happened also is going to greatly affect the readiness of the population. They're going to be on a state of alert. I mean, uh, they don't know of what exactly, but they're going to be in a state of alert in a totally natural way. Um, tsunami alarm also will contribute a lot to their level of readiness. They know that they have to do something. They might not know exactly what, but they know that they are supposed to be doing something. And uh, all of those, like the level of preparedness, is going to directly affect uh, the evacuation, how effective that evacuation is going to be. Um, there can be also other factors. For example, um, sea level rise can also affect the risk of tsunami. So here you see a sort of a slow onset event that is going to actually can have an effect on the tsunami. Um, so it's a sort of like a driver in this case. Uh, you can have a change in the level of awareness of people because of a lot of campaigns, because of a lot of participatory events that were organized. So that is going to change their knowledge of what to do in case an alarm is issued. So that is going to be greatly effective. And the change in the level of awareness, you agree, is going to change the way evacuation is going to be done. So this whole network is going to be updated. It turns out that this is actually a Bayesian network. It's an illustration of a Bayesian network, which is used quite often for multi-risk analysis because of its actually uh, power in showing these kind of intricate relations. Uh, it is good that all of these dependencies, you don't even need to distinguish between what is a triggering, what is dependency. It is all going to be shown with probabilistic dependencies. And it is Bayesian because any of these uh, nodes are variables, and they can be updated, like the level of awareness. If it changes, it is going to affect your whole network. And at the end, you're going to get a probabilistic description of all of these variables together, or any of them as you choose. So there are actually tools available for doing it. So you can see that we took it one step further to the level of uh, implementation. So that actually takes me to um, kind of the conclusion of this talk, which is somehow um, summarizing the, the advantage of scenario building based on stories. So as you can see, the stories are extremely versatile. So they can go where numbers cannot go. They, they, can, they are part of our imagination. So that's why they are much more uh, versatile in describing several situations that usually we struggle to describe numerically. Example or the context. So in that way, the stories naturally can integrate the social and physical con context together. So you don't need to, 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 it's not that challenging, but numerically it can be very challenging. Uh, they can describe slow onset events like sea level rise. They can describe shock events like an earthquake, like a tsunami. Uh, so in that case, they are also good as connectors of different contexts, such as the disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation, which are kind of traditionally dealing with different types uh, of events. Uh, and obviously, they can describe the countermeasures put in place, the capacity building activities. But there is one thing stories can do, which is, to, to me, is the most important part, is the fact that um, they, um, they, they are going to tell us what is it that we are actually going to analyze. 
Because if you put yourself in a place of a multi-risk analyst, you will see that the most difficult part is actually to decide what is it that you're going to model, what kind of interaction among the infinite range of interactions that can happen in the future, which one of them you're going to choose and to model. A story is going to pick one based on like participation, based on engagement, and it's going to tell you, analyze for me this one. And this is going to make your job much, much easier. In fact, there is a famous say on this, and I really like it. It's saying, you can insist that there is something a machine cannot do. And if you tell me precisely what that is, that a machine cannot do, then I can make a machine that will do exactly that. And that is what stories do for us. They tell us what we can go and uh, model. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and for very <laughs>